Todd, good evening. Welcome to Conversations That Count. Thank you for joining us. I promise I'll start calling you terrorists now. I am Srili Kapale. Good evening to everyone. I am Fairfax GOP Vice Chair of Strategy and Engagement. Our goal through these conversations that count is to bring in guests that can address challenges facing our communities, providing solutions and inspiring change. We also, during these conversations, will be discussing kitchen table concerns that, that are most important to Commonwealth residents. It's very important as Fairfax GOP unit members and board members to reach out to communities at large, engage our immigrant and minority community members within Fairfax County and also this great Commonwealth. The members of Fairfax GOP, are, we are all very united by a commitment to Commonwealth. And we also would like to collaborate and dedicate to ensuring that our communities are the best places possible for ourselves, our children and our grandchildren. If you would like me to bring in any guest that supports our constitution, democracy, freedom, entrepreneurship, uh, innovation, fiscal responsibility, and rule of law, please don't hesitate to put it in the chat and I will try to bring those speakers and introduce them to you. Viewers, in honor of Black History Month, I am excited to invite Mr. Terris E. Todd. Mr. Terris is the program manager of civil society and the American Dialogue from Heritage Foundation. Now, Mr. Terris, or Terris, thank you for being here. So uh, Terris, some of us might not fully understand what Heritage Foundation does and what their role, mission, vision, and values are. Would you be able to elaborate on that? Sure, first of all, Shri, thank you so much for having me tonight. Uh, truly a blessing and an honor to be with you. Um, yeah, sure, uh, the Heritage Foundation, when people think of the Heritage Foundation, for those who do not know, it is the number one conservative think tank and do tank, by the way, uh, in the world. And we've gotten uh, that wonderful number one rating for the past three years, um, even under our former president, Ms. Kay Coles James. And we are now under the great leadership of Dr. Kevin Roberts, who is who hails from the great state of Texas. And so uh, the focus of the Heritage Foundation really is to uh, deal with conservative policy, conservative public policy, and really to support uh, conservative policy across the board, uh, be it in Congress or even all over the country. And so when you think conservatism, most people do think of the Heritage Foundation. So that's kind of it in a nutshell of what the Heritage Foundation really is all about, is to really expand conservative thoughts and ideals all over the world and ultimately in this country. That's very good to know, Terrace. Terrace, if you see uh, Miss Kay Cole James, which I, I'm sure you see her frequently, say how big of an admirer we are of her and her great work that she's done for decades at this point. We are honored that she's now part of cabinet secretary, cabinet role. And I wish she would come in on our conversations that count. I would love to love to feature and talk to her. But uh, thank you for elaborating to us about this great foundation. Oh, can you elaborate not only about your role within this organization, but also what did you do in past that kind of contributed you landing into this great role? Great question. My role at the Heritage Foundation, as you previously mentioned, I am the program manager for civil society and the American dialogue. I work with a beautiful individual. She's a sweet spirit. Her name is Catherine Gorka. We call her Katie Gorka. Uh, Sebastian Gorka's wife, as most people will know her as, but she uh, obviously has her own uh, shoes to fill as well because she is a powerhouse, but uh, truly my sister in Christ. But my role as the program manager for civil society and the American dialogue, along with Katie as my director, we both are doing exactly what I'm doing here tonight is connecting with people on the ground and in communities, building those relationships all over the country for those who um, share the same principles that we do and those are conservative principles. And so Katie and I, we, we um, pride ourselves with getting out uh, all over the country, coast to coast for the most part and making those connections with people that are in local communities and trying to help them to resolve or to solve some of the issues and concerns that they're dealing with, anywhere from education to um, economic you know, issues within cities and stuff like that to really try to bring about solutions to help certain communities um, that are struggling in some of those areas. And so we come alongside them and we partner with other uh, organizations within those communities to um, meet with those uh, community leaders 
if you will, to put together some kind of a plan or to share ideas on how they can resolve some of the issues that they're dealing with on the ground. So that's pretty much it that we, what we do um, at, you know, in civil society in the American Dialogue, because we're part of the Foner Institute. So we're not a policy shop, uh, at least Katie and I are not, but we are now uh, under what is called policy promotion. And so many of the policies that come out of the Heritage Foundation, uh, our job is to actually go out and push and to support those policies and to share those policies with people that are uh, throughout our country. And so we support those policies as well. So, so that's kind of what we do. That is, that's actually uh, very good to know because as I said, common uh, Americans may not know the great work that you guys do. But as you were speaking about Heritage Foundation, I just thought of something. Do you only support conservative causes or do you kind of look at the world view and see, hey, these are the main issues that Americans are facing. So let's mm -hmm. work on those. How does that uh, planning start? Yeah, well, good question. I mean, really, I mean, to be honest with you, being a conservative public policy shop. I mean, we ultimately, we look at different issues. For example, Katie and I had gone to the city of Baltimore and we were taking a look at with some leaders that were there in the city of Baltimore. We were talking about uh, economic policy in that city to, um, to really build um, upon what they've already had, but to really try to come up with solutions that the people of Baltimore could um, all be successful in. And so so heritage, you know, not necessarily, I mean, we don't, I mean, tell you the truth, we're not really even a political uh, kind of a shop. We stay away from politics for the most part, but we focus on conservatism. And so we bring the conservative, uh, I guess, policy or the conservative principle to that situation and try to see if that's a better solution for those people that are uh, working with things that they're um, doing currently. And so, so we apply, we try to get folks to apply the conservative principle uh, to kind of help shape and form their communities and um, and look for a better way of life for those people. So um, so to answer your question, uh, I'm not certain that we go into certain meetings and ask, well, are you a liberal, are you a conservative, whatever. I don't think that really matters for the most part, but we have in mind and we're pretty solid on the fact that uh, our conservative principles work. And so we usually go in with those policy um, ideas and we take it to those communities and hopefully they will adopt those policies that we actually put forth to, um, to improve their communities overall. And so we're willing to work with anybody that's willing to work with us, to be honest with you. So Terrence, that's good to know. It's not all about politics, it's about policies because at the end of the right. day, regular people that get up early in the morning and go to work really don't mm -hmm. care about politics all that much. I think what they care is that, uh, am I able to feed my children? Am I able to improve my lifestyle? Will my kids benefit from the sure. wealth that I'm securing, right? So it really doesn't matter. I think a, a policy focus is the best way to go even to accomplish great outcomes. True, and Shri, if I, yeah. if, if I may, jump in real quick because I, I didn't get to the second part of what you had asked me before. What did I do prior to uh, coming into this role? You still want me to elaborate on that? Oh, absolutely. I, I don't want to see you to skip that at all. That's very <laughs> important for, I think, audience to understand and for me to understand as well. Sure. Oh, wonderful. Okay, thanks. So I just wanted to make sure I, I touched on this. So prior to my role at the Heritage Foundation, um, I worked for the previous administration. I was the um, I was the executive director for the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African American students all over the country at the Department of Education. And so, um, and it was truly a blessing and an honor to be in that role uh, with the previous administration because by profession, I am an educator. I worked as a former public school teacher and a public school administrator. I've also um, taught at the collegiate level as well. And so that was a tremendous blessing. And even prior to uh, landing in DC, I was the um, director for a um, uh, Head Start program in the state of Michigan for Community Action of South Central Michigan. So, so I've kind of been on the entire spectrum of education from early childhood or preschool all the way to post secondary. And so, uh, it was it was truly an honor to serve in the previous administration with all of that experience coming behind me, you know, to land at the Department of Education. So that's pretty much what I've done uh, prior to coming to. Uh, the Heritage Foundation in this particular, you know, in this capacity. That's good to know, Terrence. I was, I, I was going to ask you, you were appointed by U.S. Secretary of Education, Betsy DeWas, as the Ethics Vice Chair of the Michigan Republican Party, right? And also, I, it's my understanding that was the long vacant position of Executive Director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans, which is pretty impressive there. 
Were there any policies that you, you instituted during your term that you would like to talk with relation to education, especially during Betsy DeVos, uh, US uh, Secretary of Education time? Yeah, there were actually no policies that I actually implemented my, myself into, as an individual, but there were policies that uh, we were actually in support of that were uh, being pushed by the secretary. So she was the kind of the policy person and then everyone else came and supported. But uh, but some of the initiatives that I actually worked on, I really worked alongside with folks in the uh, HBCU uh, sector for historically black colleges and universities. So I worked alongside those folks as well and also in the K-12 sector. So when I was executive director, um, we dealt with anywhere from kindergarten all the way to post-secondary. And so what we did because of the pandemic uh, it slowed a lot of things down, but we had to go virtual at that point. And so when I got sworn in, it was May 5th of 2020. And so I only served in that capacity for nine months. But within those nine months, we were able to push push forth some virtual things that were still able to connect with people, again, out in local communities and initiatives that they had going along for making education a better process or a better experience for African-American students and really for all students all over the country. So the very first virtual roundtable that I held, because I knew it was important, was on fatherhood, uh, fatherhood and fathers being more actively engaged and involved in their children's education and trying to uh, provide solutions and really talk about solutions with other leaders all over the country on how we can actually make that more of a seamless uh, process for fathers that may have been formerly incarcerated and whatnot, or if the mother and the father were not together and they lived in opposite you know, areas. So that was the first one that we tend to tackle because I knew that ultimately when you have both parents actively engaged in a child's life, they, you know, uh, according to the data, they tend to do a heck of a lot better than what they are with a uh, single parent and without a father actively engaged. And so me being a father myself of three wonderful daughters, I wanted to tackle the fatherhood piece. So we did anything from that to uh, access to uh, internet uh, because people were going virtual and the tough challenges that many of our um, uh, students were having in regards to access to internet. So because some of them were in rural communities. And so that was another virtual round table that we tend to talk about. And we had someone that was representing uh, AT&T on there and provided solutions on how they can literally bring, uh, you know, Wi-Fi to those rural communities. And even even we found that some kids, even in uh, urban communities, did not have access to internet and may have been doing their homework from mom or dads or their own cell phones, for that matter. And so, so we kind of had those conversations um, on some of these virtual roundtables. And so, like I said, that's kind of what we were kind of confined to during the pandemic because we had to go virtual. But, but for the most part, it was a wonderful experience. And that's what that position was all about, bringing solutions to African-American leadership that are in schools and to parents and students alike uh, to make things better for them to improve and increase uh, academically throughout the country. So, so that's kind okay. of it in a Terry, nutshell. I mean, there's more, but I don't want to keep going. No, no, absolutely. That's terrific work. It's definitely worth talking about. Uh, I think virtual roundtable was a good way to get started. Uh, believe mm -hmm. it or not, as an immigrant myself, it took me a, a decade being United States to realize that rural healthcare system is a problem in rural healthcare. It took only COVID to expose to broadband issues in rural communities. Mm -hmm. So I am glad you started working because as an immigrant, I always lived in metropolitan areas because that's where mm -hmm. most jobs were. As I was telling before, this conversation. I lived in Detroit. I lived yeah. in Dallas. And then I moved to Maryland. I'm in Virginia. I've been in Virginia for a while now, but lived in all metropolitan cities, but just never realized until unless uh, COVID came in that broadband is such a huge issue in rural communities. Oh, yeah. So That's thank true. you. Yeah. I, I am sure. actually enjoying this conversation very much. I have to thank uh, my good friend, um, Katie Gorka, for referring you. I, mm, I'm, you. I'm thrilled to know about your educational experience. So Terrence, if it's okay with you, I'm going to stick with the educational issues for a bit. So um, I really want to get to the bottom of it. I'm a mom of two. My son is in college right now. My mm. daughter is, in 40, is 14 years. She's just going to go to high school next year. So I'm very passionate about education. So mm -hmm. tell me about what do you think of current educational system within Virginia? There's a lot of discussion about teaching critical race theory in schools, reducing the standards. In, um, uh, there is increasing achievement gap and whole host of issues that happen due to COVID learning, um, virtual learning. Have you heard of them? What is your take on them? I've heard of a lot of what you just talked about, you know, to be honest with you. And um, 
in particularly um, in the state of Virginia. And really, to be honest with you, Virginia is not by itself. I mean, the issues are coast to coast. Uh, and that is education simply needs to be re-engineered. I think, um, and what I mean by re-engineered is it needs to be rethought. I know that um, Secretary DeVos, she talked about rethinking education. And um, one of the things that even at the Heritage Foundation that we push for, uh, you mentioned critical race theory. Uh, obviously, we are in opposition to uh, the approach or the implementation of critical race theory in curriculum, uh, because we believe that it's very divisive. It, um, it, 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 there's winners and losers, and uh, we believe that it's basically racism fighting racism. And so, um, so, so, so we're actually dealing with some of those issues, but, but really those, those things are really distractions of the real issue. Uh, the real issue is, is the quality of education that many of our students are actually getting uh, in a lot of our school districts, uh, whether it be public schools or private or whatever, um, there are challenges all over the place. And so, uh, so school choice or education choice is a, um, uh, to, to, to us is really a sol solution to what parents are really going through. If you are unhappy with the current uh, education system that your child is in, then as a parent, you have every right. And as a matter of fact, you should be demanding that your child uh, be put into the best place possible for your child to get a quality education. And so education choice is really a hot topic. As a matter of fact, it's one of our priorities for the year um, in dealing with education and uh, education choices is kind of like the hot topic right now. And so I really think that part of the solution for our educational problems is interwoven into education choice because when you have failing schools, um, unfortunately, no one should be held captive to those school districts, you know, um, uh, I believe that poor leadership and, quite frankly, poor teachers should be should be let go, should be fired, they should be released. Um, there's nowhere else that you can find uh, in any sector where you can continue to fail miserably and still keep your job. Doesn't happen. I used to work at Kellogg's over the summer because I'm, a, you know, I'm from Battle Creek, Michigan, the home of you know, Kellogg Company, where the Frosted Flakes are at. But I used to work there over the summer. And if, if, if we continued to put out a bad product, then we were let go. It was just that simple. You know, um, it was too costly. And so I believe that our children are far more valuable than a box of cereal. And so, um, so with that being said, I think that allowing parents the choice and the options to be able to send their children to where it is best fit for them to be, um, to be successful uh, that's kind of pretty much what we're pushing now. And it's taken off like wildfire because now we're loving what we're seeing on parents being so actively engaged. I mean, you have them coming forward and they're running for school board, you know, uh, positions and whatnot. They're showing up to school board meetings. They're a little bit more active. And, and quite frankly, the uh, pandemic has a lot to credit for that because it allowed for parents now to really get an up close and personal view of what's actually being taught to their child. So when they became aware of you know, critical race theory, quite frankly, uh, like in the state of Virginia, those parents push back. And quite frankly, I think they, um, they should be rewarded and they should be praised for doing so because now they're actively engaged and because they're the ones that truly hold the power and the authority by being the taxpayer. So, so anyway, but education is such a vast issue. It's so many things to talk about in regards to education. But like I said, in a nutshell, it just really needs to be re-engineered, rethought, and, um, and it's interesting because my time at the Department of Ed, over 70, about 73, 74% of African-Americans support school choice and about 71% of Hispanic Americans support school choice. And so unfortunately you have people that are tone deaf or they're just simply ignoring the fact that these people are supportive of you know, uh, choice and education. They're still pushing things because obviously they have people that they have uh, certain allegiances to, you know, so, so they can't, they can't, you know, uh, I guess, ruffle any feathers in that regard. And so it really puts things in perspective of where their priorities really are. And quite frankly, the priority in our school districts have run away from the children. They're no longer children centered. They are more centered around uh, teacher unions and those kinds of things and bureauc you know, bureaucrats and whatnot, instead of the child themselves. And so so anyway, so I'm really happy that parents and um, other uh, leaders in the educational sector are really pushing back and really pushing for education choice because that's really the solution to it. And it becomes more competitive. If you look at our post-secondary education, for example, um, you have people coming in from all over the world. Why is that? Because it's more competitive. Uh, they're not bound to any 
you know, redlining school districts, you know, that have borders around them and saying, well, you can only go to these schools within these borders. But no, it becomes a little bit more competitive. It's entrepreneurial. Um, my daughters, for example, before they entered college, and I'm sure you're going to get these for your kids, um, you're going to start getting, you know, you know, pamphlets in the mail and they're advertising. They, they want your child there. And so why would K-12 not compete for our kids like that? They do at the post-secondary level. And so I believe that because of education choice, it makes things a little bit more competitive. And um, the quality also increases as well as proven by certain data. And so, so anyway, but again, we can talk all night about education, but, uh, but it, like I said, it's so vast and it's, it's, uh, it just needs to be re-engineered. So I think we're getting somewhere though, because parents are becoming a little bit more actively engaged in the process. And that's what many of us uh, who've worked in the public school sector have been waiting for for many, many years. And so we're really celebrating with those parents and, and saying we're supporting them and we're behind them 100%. Ferris, I can see that you're extremely passionate about education. You brought in so I, many important points. I think you're absolutely right. Our educational system, I sat through Nick Freitas, one of our delegates um, education panel a few, a few days back. And uh, he was also articulating some of the issues that you just mentioned. Our education system is 1960s education system, right? When the global world is moving forward and investing so much on the child, you're absolutely True. right. We can't um, uh, treat them like products. If we are able mm -hmm. to uh, retire a failing product, we should be able to retire the failing system and re-engineer and re-innovate and rethink about this. I sure. think you'll be very happy to hear this if you have not heard it yet. Uh, at 5 p.m., uh, Code came out and said that TJ Meritocracy uh, has stay, they won the case. The TJ Coalition has won the case. So basically, meritocracy has won the case. Granted, face, Fairfax school, school board members will go in and appeal, but I hope mm -hmm. they won't win the appeal. Uh, the, the focus on meritocracy is there, and that was discriminating against Asian American students. So I mm -hmm. think, um, as you said, parents are up, awake, thanks to COVID. That, that's one good thing that has happened because of pandemic. And mm -hmm. we are in a better place because these TJ coalition moms are out there fighting for us. So. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. But yeah, thanks for that information. Yeah, that's a good thing. Hopefully they don't <laughs> appeal, but, but you're right. That is a good thing for us. Yeah. Terrence, before we go into, you worked as a director of community outreach for community action of South Central Michigan, right? Can you talk mm -hmm. about that, please? Correct. Yeah. So after I um, <laughs> was fa phasing out my position with community action, um, I then took on another role right before I was appointed by the White House in 2020, and that was uh, the outreach. And so much of my outreach was, um, uh, well, we had to put it this way, Community Action of South Central Michigan was comprised of like four or five different counties. And so much of my job or my responsibility was to um, at least do some outreach efforts in regards to uh, the services and things that we actually provided at uh, Community Action, like uh, rental assistance. Um, they also had a, like weatherization programs and they have, uh, of course, I was the director of Head Start. So we had preschool programs alike. So my job was to really get out throughout all of those four to five counties and really share all of the information with um, local communities. And, and one of the ways that I did that is I started with the churches because I realized that many of the um, local churches or synagogues or whatever, a lot of them have people that come there weekly. And so that's where we had the highest concentration of people focused on on a weekly basis. And so I started there with sharing our information just to let them know that these services that are there that are provided by the federal government or through federal grants, uh, these things were available to um, struggling families, you know, that lived in those communities. So that's kind of what I did as the um, outreach person. So I just pretty much highlighted a lot of the services that we provided in those communities. And I went there physically. I didn't send them in the mail. I didn't shoot them an email. I went there physically in an agency car and visited those communities um, with boots on the ground and really connecting with those people. So that's pretty much what I had done. Terrace in person the meetings are the best way to kind of connect. And uh, I'm sure you realize that when you went there of how many people don't know the services that federal mm -hmm. government offers, especially in, in immigrant communities. That's kind of my passion to kind of get out conservative mm -hmm. principles into immigrant communities and also minority communities. I'm surprised how much they don't know what they don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, not mm -hmm. that I'm an expert in everything, but I feel like it's very important that someone that is entrenched into policymaking, politics, need to get out and kind of tell our people what is out mm -hmm. there that they could benefit from. 
Uh, mm -hmm. So Terrence, I also want to add that I do do outcome uh, outreach and strategy and minority engagement with Fairfax GOP. So in the future, mm -hmm. I would love to share, um, uh, kind of pick your brain and try to uh, oh, yeah. strategies you implemented that were successful. Mm -hmm. I think that's just the key point that you mentioned that you went to churches and you met uh, people in synagogues. I think mm -hmm. those are the good things to do. But if there is anything else you would love to share with me, I'll be very open to it. We are very committed to outreaching to our communities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I also got involved just to add this too. I mean, you know, I also got involved. Part of that outreach was to get involved in a lot of the local festivals and that kind of a thing, you know. So I kind of went into their world and that's what I love about what I do at the Heritage Foundation uh, as program manager of civil society along with Katie is that we love those type of things. As a matter of fact, that's why I'm in Michigan currently because I was invited to a couple of different events by the Frederick Douglass Foundation of Michigan. Um, and they were doing some outreach into the African-American community in the city of Grand Rapids and also in the city of Detroit. And so I was actually invited because I sit on their board currently, I was invited to attend uh, those things and actually, you know, to speak at those events. And so, so I enjoy that. So that was one thing uh, uh, additionally that I actually had done is to get involved in going to their world and to celebrate uh, those people in their culture and whatnot. And, um, and so that's kind of another strategy or part of the strategy that I also implemented while I was with Community Action is to get into their world and go to where they were instead of waiting for them to come to us. So Terrence, I think I said that this is actually going live on Facebook. I have a gentleman named Chris Trave that said that is asking you a question and also complimenting the services that you're providing. His thing is, are you familiar with the book, The Underground History of American Education by John Taylor Gatto? He is a seasoned educator and found that this book to be very helpful in explaining why nice. some of the same problems keep reoccurring. He's also mm -hmm. thanking you for the important work that you do at, as part of Heritage Foundation. So it's just good to know that there are people yeah. that totally believe in what you're doing. So keep up the great work right there. Yeah, yeah. Bless the person that said that. No, I really appreciate that. And I'll, I'll look that book up. No, I, I'm not familiar with that book in particular, but I will certainly look that up. So that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Excellent. Uh, so, uh, Terrence, as part of Black History Month, I've been asking guests to come uh, come on to this show and talk about African American civilization, and I'm learning quite a bit myself. But mm -hmm. what surprises me most is that media only focuses on tragedies of slavery, which I think was a horrendous thing, but seldom mentions the uh, ancient uh, African civilization ruling the world by the power of their wealth, intelligence, and strength. Uh, I mean, shouldn't be focusing on that too? Because I would love to. Hear you're coming from an Indian American background. Uh, I perk up when everyone talks about Mother Teresa, Mahatma Gandhi. So it would, shouldn't we be talking about the stories that will bring pride and is quite inspirational to African American young generation? Why are we so focused on negativity? What do you think of that? You know, I am praising you for that question because uh, one of my previous um, articles that I wrote was, matter of fact, it came out right before Christmas time uh, in December, and it was uh, Black American triumphs outweigh our tragedies. And Sri, you're absolutely right. And I, and I think that's strategic, though. I think it's on purpose. I think it's very intentional. Let me, let me say this, because as a matter of fact, what you just said about African kingdoms ruling the world at some point in time, that is absolutely true. And so... The purpose of that article was to put a light or to shine more of a light on the positive things because um, I realized one thing is that people have studied African people or African descendants of African slaves for many, many years. And so they know that we're not only a spiritual people, but we're also very passionate. And they know if they could tap into our emotional side, then they know that they can control us. And so the purpose of my article was to point out those facts and but to also shine a light on African Americans who have uh, come out of uh, those situations and have literally triumphed uh, as former slaves even. For example, the great Frederick Douglass, former slave. He uh, got to freedom. He got himself to freedom. He taught himself to read and write. And he was also a teacher of others to read and write. You know, literacy was very important. He became one of the greatest orators and writers of our time. And so um, I've talked about Mary McLeod Bethune. I even spoke about uh, Lieutenant Governor Winsome Sears uh, in my article. And so 
Uh, and then also, of course, Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina, uh, Mark Robinson. So, I, and those were just a few, but the list could go on and on of how Black Americans had literally triumphed uh, over the tragedies. And so, so to answer your question, I believe uh, it's a very good question because that is an agenda, I truly believe. I believe there's a national agenda, and I literally just spoke about this on my podcast called In the Classroom with Mr. Todd, and I talked about the game of politics. And part of the game of politics that people play and, 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 and even threats to the black to black culture or even American culture in general is media, because media is the key the key player in through it all. They they connect up with politicians and they connect connect up with a political agenda to shine or to push a certain narrative to keep people down uh, where they are. And so I think that is very strategic. I think that is part of their agenda is to keep a people in a low state to keep us focused in the rearview mirror and we'll miss what God has in front of us. And so I kind of highlight those things and um, I'm like, you know what? We are no longer going to continue to look in the rearview mirror. None of us alive today lived during those times. It was tragic. We should be transparent as possible about slavery and the atrocities of slavery. But some people like, for example, those in the CRT camp and the 1619 Project camps, they want us to believe that all of this stuff started at 1619 when they came to the shore of America. But no, 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 no. Slavery was all over the world. As a matter of fact, and I talked about how you cannot, even, even when we talk about black history, you can't put black history in one region because it's global, it's all over. You know, black people are all over the place. And so, so I'm so happy that you brought that up because uh, that article was strategically designed to share the triumphs of black Americans and we're still triumphing today. You know, you have a ton of black inventors, you have people like Dr. Ben Carson, you have all these wonderful people all over, all over the world that have uh, made a tremendous impact and changed the trajectory of, of civilization in, as a whole. And so, but you're right, African kingdoms, they were ruling the world for many, many years. So they've had their time to rule and reign at one point in time. And unfortunately they're not in that position now. And so, uh, so we try to highlight this even for the next generation. So that way they don't grow up just thinking that we've always been less than, and we've always been um, asking government for support asking them to feed us, clothe us, house us. That's just strictly nonsense. And so, so anyway, so, um, I'm, I'm, I think you said that's it one thing I'm passionate about too. So, so absolutely, <laughs> I think it is nonsense. I, I yeah. give an example. One of my uh, very good friends is an African-American young lady and myself and her worked in the hospital after doing nine to five job for about two years, she just quit. She became an entrepreneur and she's running a huge facility um, for autistic children and is doing mm -hmm. enormously well. I mean, I have such powerful African-American friends mm -hmm. that just makes me want to smile because yeah. I am where I am, but she kind of grew leaps and browns with the entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so these are the stories that are inspiring. These are the stories that media needs yeah. to be talking about and another thing terrace i want to bring it to your attention is media is also always highlighting african-american personals criminal activity and confrontation with law enforcement where are mm -hmm. the where, where are the stories about the countless number of um, Amer black americans that are keeping our community safe there are police officers there are first responders i work with doctors every single day i'm in healthcare. i see them saving lives they're nurses so who is talking about those stories i'm telling you it gives me goosebumps just to think about some of the friends that I work with, they are so much better than what media shows them to be. <laughs> you know what, <laughs> Shri, again, uh, in that article, talk about it, you know, who's talking about those things. And so I think as Black people, as Black Americans, and, and as Indian Americans, doesn't matter, uh, those who know the truth, uh, I believe that if we bond together and continue to tell the truth about what's really happening, I think we'll do a lot better. Even Denzel Washington came out one time when he was being interviewed, and he simply told a, a news reporter, he just said simply, why don't you all just tell the truth? He said, you know, no one wants to tell the truth anymore. They're just concerned about, you know, getting a story out and being first at getting that story out. And you don't care about whose life you ruin and whose career you destroy. It's just get it out. Let's sell it. You know, but if you tell the truth, I think we'll be a lot better off. But you're absolutely right. Um, there, there's been people in law enforcement. There's been people in the military. I mean, that are holding these communities together. I even pointed out the fact that, you know, like the city of Chicago, 
uh, one of my coworkers actually said that he finally eventually had gone to the city of Chicago. He said, man, it was beautiful. I said, well, yeah, I said, I said, I'm glad you said that. I said, but, but with media, they'll have you to believe that you might not leave out alive, you know, <laughs> and, um, you know, in Chicago is only like a third, you know, black, but they'll have you believe that nothing's good about the city of Chicago or Detroit or Baltimore or anything. There are good things there in those cities, but I think we have to get better at telling those good stories. So that way we can change the narrative of, um, of the few that are really ruining it for the others. So, so anyway, I appreciate Thank you me. making that point. Thank you. Now, Terrence, I know you mentioned about uh, Mr. Frederick Douglass a couple of times. Um, I'm not sure if you heard of a gentleman called K. Carl Smith. He's a nationally recognized author, speaker, and the creator of the F uh, Frederick Douglass Republican Engagement Strategy. Uh, mm. He spoke at one of, he was kind enough to come to one of uh, uh, Women's Club, where I'm the vice president of Liberty Republican Women. I invited him last mm. February to speak on behalf of uh, 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 this strategy engagement. And okay. uh, since then, I have been in awe with Mr. Frederick Douglass philosophy. So mm -hmm. um, I guess as an Indian American or just as an American, I am totally in awe with his leadership. So I'm curious to know if na national leaders such as Frederick Douglass speeches and anti-slavery writings, are they read and discussed at the dinner table in Black American homes? Because if they're not, they uh, should be. You're absolutely right. And they should be. Um, I'm not familiar with that gentleman, but I am familiar with the great Reverend Dean Nelson, who is the founder of the Frederick Douglass Foundation and also the Douglass Leadership Institute, which I am a part of. And like I mentioned before, I am on the board for the Frederick Douglass Foundation of Michigan. And so, um, but you're absolutely right. Frederick Douglass should be on the lips in the, uh, uh, of every African-American at the dinner table for those who do sit at a, at a dinner table. <laughs> um, but you're absolutely right. He should be as a local hero. As a matter of fact, Frederick Douglass was one of the ones that actually, when he broke down or looked at the uh, our constitution, he realized that it was really an anti-slavery document. It was not a slavery document. That was Frederick Douglass that literally said that. And so Frederick Douglass, man, I mean, you know, he's done a lot of tremendous work. People are still following his writings and, and things like that to this day. And quite frankly, because of his leadership, um, it's been really a nonpartisan support. You know, even though Frederick Douglass was a known Republican, but, but people can relate to Frederick Douglass because he was once a slave who got free, but then he also became even not <clears throat> um, a notable um, support to Abraham Lincoln, President Lincoln. You know, he served multiple different presidents at, on that regard because of his leadership. They were reaching out to him. But, but Frederick Douglass is absolutely, he should be one on the, um, on the mouths of most African-Americans all over this country and quite frankly, the world at the dinner table. Oh, absolutely. And I read uh, Kay Colsmith's book too. He's an author. So I was fortunate enough to get a copy of his and I read about it. It's just, I mean, I'm just in awe of, at his leadership. Mm -hmm. And another person that comes to my mind is, I think you wrote about her in one of the articles, Mary McLeod Bethune. She mm -hmm. served as advisor to five U.S. presidents. She yes. chaired President Franklin Dill uh, Roosevelt's Blacks Cabinet. She mm -hmm. also led several organizations and HBCU in Florida. So those are the people that I think um, that have contributed mm -hmm. immensely to educational areas and outstanding leadership should be That's talked right. about. But I don't hear about that when there is discussion about civil and women's rights. I, I, I seldom hear her name. Uh, mm -hmm. Why don't we bring up those, uh, what can we do to bring up those uh, names in African-American homes? Because those are the I'm, people that we need to take as a leadership, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mentors for all of us. Correct. Yeah, because I mean, again, it's probably um, strategic. Usually when we come get around to Black History Month every year, which really Black history is American history, but um, if we want to celebrate one month, okay, but I think we should be celebrated 365, you know, that's my own personal thing. But someone like Mary McLeod Bethune, I mean, a great educator um, and Black female for that matter, but she was an awesome woman of leadership. And so I think what we need to do ultimately is demand that Black history be taught in truth and, and not just your same characters every, every single year you get around. You'll hear about MLK. Definitely, we should hear about MLK. We, um, you know, you hear about Malcolm X and some of the more, um, I guess, more popular names, if you will. But, but there are even people in local communities that have changed and turned communities completely upside down because of their leadership. And so, I would love to even get down to those stories. You know, not just Mary McLeod Bethune and Frederick Douglass, but those who may not have made 
or, or who might, may not have made national recognition, but uh, have literally gone in and changed cities, you know. And, you know, I think those are, are, are um, uh, important as well. And so no one should be left out in my regard when we really want to talk about true Black history um, all over the world. And so, but I think we got to make a concerted effort. And I think mostly uh, people or parents, if you will, they should be demanding that the, these Black leaders that have been um, uh, uh, phenomenal leaders over the history or the course of our history, I think they should demand that those people also be recognized as well uh, in schools today. And so unfortunately, you know, they're not getting that information at school. So of course, you got to resort to Google and kind of go and look these people up when you hear about them. I have a book called Blacks First, and it's a very thick book, but it's uh, a, a book that's filled with uh, Black Americans um, all over this country who have been inventors. They've come up with inventions or they were the first Black uh, to be in some, you know, some leadership roles and whatnot. Um, I would strongly recommend that book uh, as well. And then there's also Black History 365. I just recently had gotten my hands on from the one of the authors of that book. Uh, Black History 365 is uh, another good one as well uh, to really learn a little bit more about Black American history. But uh, But we should be demanding that Black history or, you know, should really be demanding that it be taught daily in our schools. And so hopefully we'll get there at some point. There is, hopefully that would change because we also have Miss uh, Rockstar, Miss Winsome Sears, my That's favorite right. uh, lady, uh, Lieutenant Governor. She wrote into office advocating for better pay for teachers, law enforcement. Mm -hmm. She advocated yeah. for lower taxes, more career centers for veterans. I mean, mm -hmm. her commitment to Black Virginians advisory cabinet for the Garner. And uh, it's just like she's invested so much into Black uh, communities. Yeah. Again, mainstream doesn't talk about her. I mean, mm -hmm. Black leaders don't pay attention to her accomplishments. But you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. We have to tie their hands and have them focus on what these. And we should be talking about every community leader. In fact, yeah, that's right. Black uh, uh, I always say, if you say, say, who is your hero? I say my mom. It need not be mm -hmm. some national leader. It's just my mom who put me through an education. Right. Where girls were not allowed to study back home in that small mm -hmm. town. So who yeah. can be the best hero than my mom? So it's like local leaders, right? We need to bring That's that right. So uh, let, me, let me go into your personal. I, I think you, um, I, I, when I was kind of trying to research a little more about you, I see that you're also the author of Just Being There, A Parent's mm -hmm. Guide to Raising Children. Um, mm -hmm. As you know, society has play, painted Black fathers with a broad brush. I think you explained that very, very well. They, mm -hmm. there's, uh, they stereotype them into missing in action and unresponsive to their children's mm -hmm. needs, which I, I don't think that is true. But uh, I want you to kind of talk to me about it, but that what can we do as a society to end these gross mischaracterizations, mm -hmm. which is super saddening to me. Why would we do that to black fathers? <laughs> yeah, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, you know, and, and, and to be honest with you, Sri, that was really one of the main reasons why I pointed out in the very first virtual roundtable um, with my appointment with the White House previously, uh, my very first virtual roundtable was to highlight the active engagement of fathers. You know, when you look at the data in, in the black community in general uh, of, um, you know, households being headed by a single parent, automatically we think that that household is being headed by a, a single mom, you know, but there are some single fathers as well that are raising their children as well. And so, but unfortunately they get left out. Um, what also gets left out is the um, uh, is is the idea that if we were to ask many of these black fathers that may not be physically in those homes, you know, how many of you would love to be actively engaged in your kids' lives? I guarantee you that 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 number would probably be ninety nine percent, if not higher. You know, like yeah, absolutely, I want to be in my child my children's lives, and so so we never hear that piece of data of how many of them are actively engaged in their children's lives. We only see the data that shows that um, that the, how, the home or the household is being headed up by the black mom or the black female, but we never talk about the engagement of the fathers. And so that's why I made that comment that they're literally painted with this broad brush like we're unhinged or like we're just not engaged in our children's lives. But there are many of us who are um, engaged in our children's lives. As a matter of fact, I was telling someone I don't know if it was my Newsmax interview, but I was telling someone I can't think of a, of anyone that I know personally that aren't engaged in their kids' lives, to be honest with you. So so this whole narrative that the men are, are not um, around and they don't want any involvement in their children's lives is just completely false because so these men do want to be actively engaged. 
I think you wrote it very well. You said it's a gross mischaracterization and stereotyping mm -hmm. that is uh, is so not very inspirational for younger Black Americans. And I just don't yeah. think that they taught children because those are the mm -hmm. people that they look up to. And this That's is right. not what they should be hearing about their parents whatsoever. So yeah. uh, no, thank you for writing that. I think I always and never forget about um, black, uh, any divorces, right? Uh, whether it is mm -hmm. a mom divorce or a dad divorce, I think it's easier mm -hmm. to say single moms work hard. I think single dads work equally hard. And we just mm -hmm. really need not look at it as single mom or single dad. It's just more of a, either a family or somebody that's just working hard to bring, to raise their kids. It could be either mm -hmm. mom or either dad. Uh, so right. uh, Terrace, I mean, I, as you know, we are watching with heavy heart what is happening in our country right now, especially the tra tragedy of Ukraine and fall. Uh, I mean, um, uh, I have two team members that work with me that come, one comes from Ru Ukraine, one comes from Russia. So it's just, I know that um, innocent uh, Ukrainians are play praying for their safety, but also Russian citizens who are boldly protesting in the streets, even though they yeah. know they could go to jail for doing that. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and all that is happening in geopolitical arena, our, <laughs> our president uh, has shut down the Keystone pipeline. He's demonstrating mm -hmm. to Russia uh, and the world that we are no longer energy independent. Here we are talking about transgender policies, vaccine, mask right. mandate, PRT. Right. I mean, what's going on? I mean, these are very concerning to me because I would rather talk about security, national security, mm -hmm. uh, security uh, securing our borders. Uh, what can mm -hmm. we do to make sure any, we are becoming energy independent so we're not spending the, so much money at the gas station because it's impossible for a regular person to just work anymore. Um, but then the focus is on transgender policies, vaccines, mass mm -hmm. mandate. Well, how do you how do you think we move forward? Can Heritage Foundation kind of advocate for these issues? Where does that right. come into picture? Well, I'm glad. G great question. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, as you were talking, and I, I was loving every minute of it because uh, to be a part of the Heritage Foundation, we we keep them honest. You know, we keep those things in the forefront of people's minds and in their hearts about what the true issues really are, you know? And uh, that's what I love about the work that we do um, at the Heritage Foundation and many of our experts in the policy or public policy arena, um, uh, meeting with people on Capitol Hill to push forth certain policies to actually address some of these issues that are going on in our world today. But those are just simply distractions, you know? They are to basically say, oh, there's nothing to see over here, but let's just focus over here. And that's quite frankly, being Black History Month, that's what's been happening in the Black community for, for several decades. Let's focus on systemic racism. Why? Because everything's racist, everyone's racist, but yet we still have children that are not reading at grade level. We still have some dropping out. We still have a lot of crime that's taking place. You know, we still have individuals that are maybe even dropping out of college and whatnot. So we have other issues. We have families that we need to try to rebuild and bring those mothers and fathers back to be actively engaged in their children's lives. But no, but rather let's just focus on how racist these people are. Let's just focus on, you know, uh, uh, critical race theory and all that. But again, those are all distractions to get you distracted from what the issue, the true issue is at hand. And that's exactly the same strategy that they're using currently with the issue that's going on in the Ukraine. And, but um, the, the people of Ukraine and the people of Russia, uh, they should know, know without a shadow of a doubt that, you know, you have some people here in the United States that are praying for you, that are believing for, for peace to prevail, uh, for righteousness to prevail. And so they certainly have a friend uh, with the Heritage Foundation and those of us who are believing and praying for them uh, each and every day that uh, some peace will be brought out of this whole um, uh, issue that's going on over there right now. But, but, I, but I think we have to keep things the main thing, though. Uh, and that's, the, again, what the Heritage Foundation intends to do is to keep things at the forefront so that way people don't get lost throughout all of the noise and the, all of the distractions that are trying to be pushed out by the media and uh, by this current administration. And so, um, so yeah, but we're praying and we're believing, but we're doing the right thing at the Heritage Foundation to keep it in the forefront of, uh, of the American public. So. So thanks thank for you. that question. No, thank, thanks to you and the Heritage Foundation. I can't thank you guys enough for the great work that you guys do. Um, so Terrace, as we are coming to the end of the show, I, I have like one or two more questions just to kind of get to the core of mm -hmm. uh, what I try to do. How? What is the best way to reach out to African-Americans? I know we go to churches, we talk to pastors, we like to talk to civil rights leaders. We also mm -hmm. uh, want to partner with NAACP if it is appropriate. Uh, so mm -hmm. uh, are those the right venues or am I I'm missing something big time and you're like oh god Shri, stop do this <laughs> what do you think 
Yeah, you know, very good question. Um, when I was uh, the vice chair of the Michigan Republican Party, um, me being a black man anyway, um, again, everything that I went back to was the church, uh, because quite frankly, uh, regardless of where black people are uh, in their lives, they are spiritual people, they're passionate people. Uh, we believe in our God, we, our faith is very important, our families are important, so, um, the, but the best bang for your buck, if you're going to meet them or, or connect with them on a larger scale, you can find them, most of them at church. And so, um, so that would be my strong recommendation. But other than that, um, the NACP would be uh, a good connection as well. But I would really start with the church because unfortunately in the black community all over this country, not too many black, uh, black Americans really look to people like the NACP uh, and, 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 and politicians, quite frankly, they don't look to them for leadership. Um, they look to some people that are in the communities. As a matter of fact, I've had the pleasure of visiting with an individual in Jacksonville, Florida, and they have a tremendous ministry down there, Bishop Mark McGuire, and that um, the, the Potter's House, uh, Jacksonville down there. And um, they have literally brought individuals off the street and, and, and um, made them be part of the ministry to do outreach work that way, you know, and this is outreach work that is done at night, reaching individuals that are living that street in, in, in um, I guess, uh, gang lifestyle, if you will, you know, and uh, trying to help them, you know, you know, turn their lives back towards a positive, you know, put them on a positive path. And so uh, a lot of great work that's being done there. But, um, but anyway, if you're going to really meet or reach someone, you know, the best bank for your buck, I would say, uh, in the black community would be at the church, you know, with the uh, faith-based leaders in those communities. And the Urban League, the Urban League is also, if you have um, an Urban League in those areas, uh, those are great um, places to start as well. Terrence, I don't want to sound ignorant, but uh, what does Urban League do? I want to make sure I get that. So I can put that as part of the strategy. Yeah, the Urban League is not like, um, is not like an NACP. NACP is mainly known to be for the civil rights, you know, kind of a, um, organization. But, uh, but the Urban League, I mean, even though they are for civil rights, but the Urban League is a little bit more focused, um, more so on like housing and education. Uh, they're more focused on things like um, economic development types of things. And so the Urban League would be a great, um, a great tool or a great resource to reach out from that regard. But, uh, but they do, you know, they may do some, you know, some collaborative work with NACP branches or whatever, but, but they're mostly focused on those things like economic development, education, as well as, um, as, well as um, housing and issues like that. So, so they have different programs to, to really reach that. I'm so you know, thankful you said that because yeah. that was not part of my strategy plan at all. And um, mm -hmm. I'm very sincere when I say I really want to reach out to Blacks and Hispanics and Asian Americans mm -hmm. and make sure mm -hmm. they understand our conservative values. I think by nature, they're conservative. And I, I tell this to Fairfax GOP and any other uh, Republican leaders that want to hear me. I said just saying that uh, we, we value each other and we value the same principles. Mm -hmm. So what for me is not going to cut it anymore. We just really yeah. need to go to organizations such as Urban League and try to partner with them to see what can we do for the community that, mm -hmm. uh, that they feel that we are truly partnering, sincerely partnering and sure. looking out in the best interest of them. So yeah. no, thank you for mentioning. And you don't want to lead with um, anything politics, you know, um, exactly. just be yourself. I mean, you know, you're a professional. Uh, I, I believe you're in the medical field. So um, even just leading with your just regular name, you know, and just saying, hey, I, I, my name is such and such, you know, would love to find out what some things you guys are doing that um, that maybe we could be a part of. But you don't have to. I would strongly recommend not leading, you know, the conversation right from the gate. With, uh, with it being political, because then they'll think that, you know, it's not genuine. So most Black people can sniff that out if it's genuine or not. And so I think that's what uh, many of us have been successful with, with doing, you know, like I said, I was here in the state of Michigan, and I also had the opportunity to do a ribbon cutting for an HBCU hub at a local high school. And, um, but again, representing the Heritage Foundation, non-political, and, um, but I was there, you know, I was actually one of the ones cutting that ribbon for uh, a black student union inside of a high school for an HBCU hub. And so um, so that's what you want to do. You don't want to lead, you know, from a political standpoint. You just want to leave, you know, lead, being genuine, being, you know, being authentic. 
Exactly. And I think I always say politics is only 10% of people's lives, right? The bureaucrats right. of politics, the politicians obviously like, uh, but the rest of the people just don't care. They just That's really, right. really look for a candidate that will meet in the middle, listen to them, genuinely share their concerns and look out for the best interest of their children and grandchildren. True. I mean, I yeah. would vote for that kind of person. I do really don't care for a politician that has multi-million dollars uh, right. that is knocking on my door. I'm like, what are you going to do for my children? <laughs> that's that's right. what I care about. That's so, very important. Yeah. Absolutely. Terrence, this has been such an enriching, I can't believe it's an hour. Oh, wow, yeah. Of your time. I know you're, I think you're, you said that you're in Michigan with, with your daughter's game. So uh, I, I sincerely thank you. Uh, uh, Terrence, before I let you go, <laughs> I would like you to take a minute or two and let the audience know if I missed asking you anything that you think is very important. You're like, Ter uh, Shri, you brought me on for uh, Black History Month as a Black community leader. I do this great work. You, you didn't mention about about it and uh, you think our audience will appreciate here listening about it please please take this minute and let our audience know if there is anything that i missed uh, sure no thank you Sri. again thank you so much for having me uh truly a blessing and an honor to be with uh, you here tonight um the only thing that i would add um at, at this juncture is to uh send people to heritage.org again that is heritage.org uh, that is our website they could go there uh, maybe sign up to become a member, sign up for our newsletters and stuff like that. They can get a lot of information on heritage.org uh, of any policy related issues or whatever uh, that may come up. Um, they can find it there. Also, we have another website um, called Level Up Civics. Uh, that is our civil levelupcivics.org, excuse me. That is our um, civics, you know, uh, project or civics program that we have that's coming through Heritage as well. And so anything civics, they can go there and look things up or whatever. But that that site actually is, you know, evolving into uh, something greater and larger. So but there are some materials there that are there now or information that's there now, some videos like of Martin Luther King Jr. and his life and stuff like that that he's gone through. But um, but other than that, I mean, you know, heritage.org, I would I would say to go there first uh, to look at what we have there and they can type in the search bar of anything that they want to look up uh, in relation to conservative principle and conservative policy to find there. But uh, but again, thank you so much for having me. Um, this is truly a blessing and an honor to be here. And um, I greatly appreciate it. You also mentioned my book um, that is actually out on Amazon. Um, just being there, a parent's guide to raising children uh, that actually came out like this past June. And so really, really proud about that piece of work um, where I'm actually providing families with tips on how to raise children um, in a faith, you know, in a faith home. Um, but, you know, but but raising them properly. Again, it's not a one size fit all approach to raising kids, but hopefully in that book, it'll provide a few tips for, you know, new parents or whatever. If they're expecting parents, maybe they can get a few tips from the book on, on different ideas of how to raise their children to be successful in life. And so, um, so anyway, again, just being there, uh, you can find that out on Amazon. Terrence, thank you so much. This has been a very enriching uh, interview or conversations. I appreciate your willingness to participate in conversations that count. You sure are doing the right things with community engagement. The Heritage Foundation is truly lucky to have you. I have to oh, thank, thank Katie Orca for letting you come here. Keep up the phenomenal yeah. work. And I hope we get to you work too. together in the future on outreach and engagement activities. I, I look forward to, to it. I look thank forward you. to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, uh, viewers, we as Americans, I say, especially with what is going on in this world, we are so blessed to live in a country where we can speak out, stand for freedom, stand up loud and clear against socialism and divisive Marxist policies and government infringements of our daily lives. Like um, Terry said, let's not go with what media is saying because they really want us to fight amongst ourselves. I mean, pit amongst ourselves. Let's try and look around and say, why are they doing what are they are doing to pit amongst ourselves? Else. If the Caucasian citizens of Ukraine can fight in the streets to protect our country, uh, to protect their country, and courageous Russians can protest in the streets against Putin when they know they'll be arrested, we certainly can speak the truth. We certainly can be uh, very out there, be authentic, and do whatever we possibly can to make this community stronger and stay together. Staying together is the key. 
As we continue to honor our Black community leaders during Black History Month, I will have Ms. Mary Milburn tomorrow at 6 p.m. Ms. Milburn, among her many distinguished accomplishments, she had the honor of singing for 43rd, 44th, and 45th U.S. presidents, and she was and for the 80th anniversary and commemoration of Pearl Harbor. So she'll be here tomorrow, just like uh, we spoke to Terrace, and we heard a lot about um, uh, his activism, his community engagement, his work with this great foundation. Heritage. Uh, we also will hear from Ms. Mary Melvin about uh, her accomplishments and the work she has been doing in Black community and community at large. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening and God bless you and God bless America. Thank you, Terrace. Thank you very much.